Then a uh, good afternoon to all participants in the online public hearing organized by the Independent Evaluation Commission for assessing the integrity of candidates for the position of members in the self-administration bodies of judges and prosecutors pursuant to law number 26 stroke 2022. I hereby declare this session open. This hearing involves the resumed evaluation of Mrs. Christina Gladkov, candidate for the Superior Council of Prosecutors and prosecutor in the Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office. I would like to welcome you, Mrs. Gladkov. We are here to Not come- to ask. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. We are here to conduct an online public hearing in the context of the resumed evaluation process aimed at assessing candidates for the position of the Superior Council of Prosecutors. The Commission is acting in accordance with Law Number 26, Stroke 2022, and its rules of procedure. On the screen in front of you, you have the five members of the Commission, and I will name them Victoria Henley, Nadesha Ripchewski, Tatiana Radikanu, Nona Tsutsuria, and myself, Hermann von Hebel, the Chair of the Commission. The Commission is assisted by members of the Secretariat and the online public hearing can also be followed by representatives of the media and the public. And members of the media and the public are advised to keep the camera switched off and the microphone muted. During the hearing, interpretation between Romanian and English will be provided. To allow for accurate interpretation, I would kindly ask you to speak clearly and slowly. Furthermore, the proceedings are being recorded and the public parts will be available online, generally within 24 hours after the hearing via the website of the Commission, www.fetting.md. I will start with a brief overview of the procedural background of this resumed evaluation. On 18 May 2023, the Commission issued a decision in relation to your integrity evaluation for the position of member in the Superior Council of Prosecutors. In its decision, the Commission decided that there are serious doubts about your compliance with the criterion of financial and ethical integrity in relation to failure to disclose yours and your husband's income to the tax service, state tax service, and failure to pay taxes and sub-evaluation of purchase prices of a particular car. On 9 June 2023, you appealed this decision to the Supreme Court of Justice, and on 1 August 2023, the Supreme Court of Justice annulled the Commission's decision and ordered a re-evaluation. On 8 September of this year, the Commission started the resumed evaluation, and on 16 October 2023, pursuant to Article 19, Paragraph 1, Litera C of its Rules of Procedures, the Rules of Procedure, the Commission sent you a statement of facts and serious doubts. On 23 October 2023, you responded in writing to the statement of facts and serious doubts. And on 1 November 2023, you confirmed again to the Commission that you wish to participate in a public hearing. During this hearing, the Commission will take into account your privacy and where required and possible the privacy of your family members and close persons. So we will leave out unnecessary details relating to, for example, ID numbers, bank account numbers, addresses of real estate and the like. For the protection of your own privacy, we ask you to do the same. The present hearing takes place at your request and the hearing will be focused on the statement of facts and serious doubts that the Commission has sent to you and your written response to the statement of facts. The Commission would like to invite you now, if you so wish, to briefly provide additional explanations to complement your written response to the statement of facts and serious doubts that you submitted to the Commission. I urge you to be concise in your explanations. You will be given a maximum of 50 minutes for each of the issues mentioned in the Statement of Facts and Serious Doubts. Afterwards, one or more members of the Commission may have questions for you about the explanations you have provided. In case we will have any questions for you, we will try to keep them short and to the point, and we ask that your answers be short and to the point as well. 
We also ask you to answer all questions truthfully and completely. And your explanations are, of course, important to the Commission in verifying your financial and ethical integrity. I would like now to hand over to Nadesia, Nadesia Rybczewski to lead the discussion with you on the statement of facts and serious doubts. Nadesia, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Mr. Chairman. Greetings, Madam Gladkov. The first issue that we will address, you've also seen it in the statement of facts as well, where the serious doubts are also there regarding the failure to pay taxes in 2021. The apologies. Mr. Hebel gave me the possibility to, to come with a response before we start actually the public hearing. I would like, and I think that there are certain aspects that I would like to first um, establish before we move on to the hearing process, which I believe will be important in terms of my defense if that is required. All right, the procedure he well he explained the procedure for every issue i will just say what the doubts are and then you will have 15 minutes to provide an explanation for every issue if there's anything else that you want to talk about in addition to those issues then we can stop here and i understood you nadezhda so initially and to start with the first, the, the initial evaluation was somewhat novel for all of us. What came next was at the court, at the Supreme Court of Justice. And now we are in the so-called reevaluation of candidates. And before we proceed to the public hearing, I would like to tell all the members of the commission because I won't perhaps have any other opportunity to talk to the members of the commissioners and the law provides that we cannot have an interaction outside public hearings and that we can also interact only via the, the messages. But the, 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 the intermediate of our communication is the secretariat. Now, uh, as for the activity of the commission, in addition to the international and national law, that is also subject to the regulation and to the law number 26 of 2022. In the regulation, the regulation is mandatory for all to be applied, and there is a procedure that is detailed, a procedure that has to be observed by all the members. And so it is fair that, well, today I've looked into the copies of documents that were submitted to me at the headquarters of the secretariat and i would like to communicate with the commission because by communicating by email with the secretariat a number of petitions were filed a number of requests were submitted and the law on what well, the, the the administrative code the law on petitioning provide there has to be a response provided by the commission so the secretariat informed me that they, the Secretariat, is responsible for communication. I was told that, but I would like to know why none of the, none, no letter, no response was signed by anyone. There was no signature. In Moldova, I don't know where currently the members of the Commission are. You are not uh, subject to the jurisdiction and legislation of Moldova, because it is, it is provided that any answer to a petition before the accumulation of information is finished with regards to a candidate before moving on to the public hearing, there are provisions that say that all answers must be, shall be provided to the petitions. And the regulation states that, well, uh, I put this down in my petition, I'm not sure you had the chance to see it, that they all have to be signed by the chair of the commission. In this case, my petitions contained uh, requests for documentation, nothing complicated. It was requests of documentation that had to be in these volumes, in the copies, in this case file of the candidate. I would like, like to communicate to you that today I was unfortunately given copies. I asked in order to compare these copies to the administrative case of the candidate. So this is a fundamental right of the candidate 
So as far as I was communicated, that was only kept in digital form. I do not mind for, for that to be kept in a digital form though, but today I was only given some copies, some copies that were certified by a person that I don't know who that is. So that's what I wanted to know, to be able to make my position clear, to be able to, to provide my explanations in a way that everybody acts in good faith. I want to know, I want to be informed. Who is the person that certified that the copies corresponded to the original? That is not clear to me. There is a signature. What is more, in the case file that I got today, there is no signature of any member of the commission. And what is awkward that I was looking back, not even at the stage of the Supreme Court of Justice, I found no document signed by the commission. In Moldova, the Administrative Code of Moldova provides that if the Administrative Act is not signed, it is null and void. So for us to have a public hearing now that is fair and in line with the regulation as a final stage with the possibility for the candidate to, to have all the guarantees observed, well, that is why those petitions were filed every initial phase even even when I was on a leave on a leave where I was supposed to to be with my children on certain days I wasn't able to have access to the internet I nevertheless did my best to ask for that documentation and I thought that the documents would be there today but there aren't the minutes aren't there and the documents that I sought aren't there either. First of all, I would like to receive all decisions with signatures on them. Moldova provides for two um, signatures, either the digital one or the handwritten signature. So either of them. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Plakov, for raising these questions. And, and we, of course, seen uh, these questions also reflected uh, in the uh, communication by email uh, at, to, the, uh, to the Secretariat, which, of course, has then been passed on to the Commission. Um, and uh, you have uh, received this morning around noon uh, a response to a number of your questions, and those responses were, of course, coordinated and are coming from the Commission. So um, the, the working methods that the Commission has applied or, and continues to apply is, of course, based, as you said, on Law Number 26 and on our own rules of procedure. Um, and as you know, in, in Law Number 26, uh, there is a provision relating to the Secretariat. The Secretariat, uh, according to, what is it, Article uh, 4, I think it is, um, functions under the exclusive responsibility uh, of the Secretariat. Um, and in our rules of procedure, we have elaborated further rules on our working methods and, of course, also the role of the Secretariat. So in Article um, 15, for example, of our rules of procedure, you will see that the communication of the Commission shall take place with candidates via email, as has been taking place all along, both during the initial evaluation with you and, of course, also in the context of the resumed evaluation with you, all uh, communication with you have taken place via that email. And of course, also at Rule 21 of our um, Rules of Procedure provide further provisions on the functioning and the role of the Secretariat. And it says that the Secretariat assists the Commission in exercising its duties, um, that the Head of Secretariat shall report to the Chairperson regarding everyday operations, uh, that all staff contracted under the independent directive of the Commission. And of course, also, and I think this is very important, that the Head of Secretariat is mandated to execute all decisions of the Commission and to respond to all information requests of members as per Article 15 of these rules and to manage and is very important and to manage all necessary steps for communication. So the working methods that we have is that, of course, all communications from candidates do come via email to the Secretariat and thereby also to the Commission. The Commission looks into all issues that are raised by the candidates and then the Commission takes decisions in that respect. And the Head of Secretariat is mandated according to the rules 
to submit those responses by the commission back to the candidate. In our view, and that has been the constant practice and during the initial evaluation and during the resumed evaluation, not only with you, but with all candidates, there is no need for a signature from the chair or any other person of the commission. It is a, a, a logical consequence of the rules as we have established them. This is very effective. That is also a practice that I am familiar with in many other organizations and courts I have worked with in different parts of the world. And this is also reflected um, in our rules, which have been adopted indeed officially by the uh, commission. Um, in response to your question about the signatures on the documentation that you received this morning, that the, the signature that you see over there is the signature of our member, Tachana Raducanu, who has been specifically authorized by me as a chair to sign the documents in those situations that I personally am not in a position to sign the documents uh, when not being in Chisinau. Uh, and so that is the working method that we have established. And uh, Tachana Raducanu has been able to, uh, to sign all the documentation uh, for you. Um, as uh, we, I also, as you know, also the statement of facts and the serious doubts were sent to you um, on the 16th of October. In that letter, we also made it clear that uh, the materials that we have collected during the initial and the resumed evaluation were available at the Secretariat. And I have been informed that this morning you were able to pick them up from the Secretariat and I see them also lying on the desk in front of you. I hope that answers all the questions that you have heard. Um, and also, and most of them have, of course, also been reflected in our uh, email correspondence uh, with you. Um, and um, if that is the case, then I would suggest that we continue with our um, evaluation discussion or resumed evaluation discussion. Um, Mr. Hebel, I didn't receive an answer. I did not receive an answer. I requested for a signature so I can read out of the administrative, administrative code article 121 in the Republic of Moldova for acts to have legal power. For the administrative acts to have legal power, there has to be an either handwritten signature or electronic signature. So if, for instance, we are going to look at the copies of the documentation that was certified by Madame Raducanu, we can see that the, well, the copy corresponds to the original, that is, the act in original that Madame Raducanu has seen and the copy was made of that. But in the case, uh, in the case file that I've got in this dossier, I would want you to see that there is not there is no signature of yours at all. Perhaps that practice, the judicial practice is applied somewhere, but at the current stage in Moldova, this ju the judicial practice isn't applied where a signature is to be certified. In this case, I ask for a decision, an initial decision to be issued, and the decision with reasonable doubts with a signature on it, either handwritten signature or digital signature. That is what I asked for. The confirmation of Madara Lucano can be put here when there is a copy made of an original document. That's the only instance when a, copy, a signature can be put in that. Now, looking back, back at that, at the SCJ stage, there is also a copy that has been operated with. The copy corresponds to the original. In my electronic, uh, on my email, there's only a picture of the act of the document. Currently, uh, now I have the right to have in my hand an administrative act that bears electronic or handwritten signature. That is what I want to communicate to you. Thank you very much for that communication. What I would suggest is, um, without going into a repetition of what I already said, the working methods of the Commission have been laid down by the law, law number 26, also by our rules for procedure. Our activities and our communication with you and the documentation provided to you are completely in conformity with those rules and with the law. Uh, and so we are bound by our law number 26 and we do so. 
Um, what I would suggest is if you were to have any further questions on this particular issue that we communicate after the hearing, and uh, you can submit your uh, any further questions that you may have in writing to the Secretariat through our normal procedure. Uh, and of course, we will address any questions that you have. But just in order to make effective use of our time uh, now, I would suggest that we move on with the resumed evaluation. So I would like to give the floor now to Nadesha Rybjewski. Uh, Nadesha, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Madam Gladkov, we will proceed to addressing the first issue. Madam Nadezhda, please tell me, so all the situations of procedure before the hearing, so is it my understanding that automatically we can establish that there's a violation of the fact as I as a candidate, nobody's establishing that so we are we preparing for a public hearing in a way as to have my right to defense observed. So I am here alone, Madam Gladkov. You communicated to to the commission requests in writing. The commission did it did its best to answer to them as soon as possible. It was well, not the commission, but the secretariat. We received an answer. Now we would like to proceed to the public hearing because the purpose of the commission is to finalize your re-evaluation and to be able to issue a decision which is the final act if you continue to challenge certain aspects related to the procedure they can be asked in writing they're not matters related to the procedure these are matters that have to do with the discussed issues and by no means do i want it to be looked at as a conflict all i want is to have access to materials so as to be able to correctly, well, you have all the materials that were submitted, all the materials are there, all. There is nothing else? No. This is everything. You have the materials of the evaluation. Understood. Then please tell me what I'm interested in. And this has to do with the subjects that you want to address. If there is, and if, why, then, then, the, why the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice translated into English isn't in the material. So please tell me then how Mr. He uh, Hebel, how Madam Victoria, how Madam Nona had access to the contents of the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice. As you know, uh, the well, the, the international members, Madam, Madam Gladkov, if I may cut you off, the materials in English are for the members and the members have all the materials that they needed. All the rules on the translation of documents are there. The materials in English were to you because the commission received all the documents in Romanian and that is the procedure. Understood, I just wanted the confirmation of the fact that all three members were able to get familiar with the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice. Certainly all the decisions of the Supreme Court of Justice were translated and all of them are available for the commission. For the commission. In this case, the next question regarding the doubts that were submitted to me. As per the regulation, uh, it says that any intermediary, preliminary, and all the other decisions are to be signed by the chair of the commission. I would like to know what the position of the commission is, if, because just to to provide some details to this day and I haven't seen in my dossier a mandate whereby the secretariat is given the right to put signatures or to draw conclusions and as in as a right of the secretariat. The secretariat according to the regulation has the obligation to only provide assistance to the commission. Now what is very important for all of us, for everyone, not just for myself, it is to establish and I would like the members of the commission to confirm the fact that they that they uh, have seen the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice of 1st of August and that the doubts that were presented repeatedly by the commission, that that is the position of the national and international members. The one that was sent by the secretariat. 
Madam Klavkov, I think that I would not take my own responsibility serious, and I suppose that applies to all members of the Commission, if we would uh, do a resumed evaluation of candidates without having had a thorough understanding and studying of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Justice. Uh, so uh, it goes without saying, I would say, that the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice of the 1st of August in relation to you and all other candidates have been translated into English um, and that we have received that uh, decision, have carefully studied and based on that decision have started the resumed evaluation in your case and all other cases. That you have not seen a signed decision from the Commission in relation to the resumed evaluation has to do with the obvious fact that there has been no decision yet taken by the Commission. The Commission on the 16th of October sent you a statement of facts which are not a decision by the Commission because they are a basis for your response in writing and also for the hearing today. It, would, uh, it, is, it goes without saying that after the evaluation hearing of today and taking into account the decision of the Supreme Court, the, the statement of facts, all the materials that have been collected will be taken into consideration and will then lead to a recent decision uh, by the commission. And of course, that recent decision will be signed by the chair as per our rules. I would like in particular to uh, draw your attention to the uh, law num our law number 26, uh, which clearly in Article 13 um, refers to the decision of the Evaluation Commission. And it says, once the evaluation procedure is completed, the Evaluation Commission shall issue a recent decision. Obviously, we are in the hearing today, so the evaluation procedure, also the resumed evaluation procedure, is not completed. Um, also, in Article 8 of the Rules of Procedure, Article 8, Paragraph 1, uh, Litera E, uh, the matters considered, you also referred to that in your written communication uh, with the Commission through the Secretariat. Decisions on candidates as per Article 13 of Law Number 26, and it refers to preliminary, partial, or final evaluation findings. None of that again have taken place, obviously, because we are still in the process of the resumed evaluation. Um, so, uh, and then finally, also, may I draw your attention to Article 19, uh, Paragraph 1, Litera C of our Rules of Procedure. These are the rules for the conducting of the resumed evaluation. Um, and under C, we say, unless the Commission has issued a decision passing the candidate, and we have not taken a decision, and the, here it comes, it will present a statement of fact and serious doubts to the candidate and a request for the candidate to indicate whether the candidate wishes to participate in a public hearing. We have not taken a decision. We have prepared a statement of facts and serious doubts. That is a document that does not require a signature by me or anyone else from the Commission and therefore has been transferred to you on the 16th of October through the uh, Secretariat. Um, so that is the procedure as we apply within uh, the Commission. I hope it addresses all the concerns uh, that you have. Um, may I therefore then give back the word to Nadeshda for the continuation of our resumed evaluation. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess, uh, scuse me, noi putem confirma, da, noi am confirmat deja și în scris. We have just... already confirmed in writing uh, what you received on the 16th October was sent by the Commission. The Secretariat sends what the co Commission authorizes it to send, so that represents a document of the Commission. Let's now jump to the first issue about the failure to pay taxes for 2021. The Commission has serious doubts about your financial and ethical integrity because you fail to disclose to the state tax service the income you obtain from uh, capital gain for selling a land plot and not paying uh, the related tax within the time frame set by the tax 
tax code. When asked by the Commission, you said you paid around one year after you were obliged to report and pay the taxes in the law. So now, Madam Gladkov, as uh, Mr. Herman von Hebel mentioned, according to procedure, you have up to 15 minutes to provide any additional explanation you uh, feel due uh, besides what you provided in writing. Till th there was, this was an attempt to move to the doubts that the commission sees and that were received. In this situation, from the beginning, I found that there is no document signed uh, physically or digitally. It was found that according to the regulation, the preliminary conclusions that were sent to my email box were supposed to have an electronic signature on. That's what the regulation provides for. Besides, practice law is being applied in Moldova. Uh, I would also like to inform the international members, particularly that with respect to all three doubts, the Supreme Court uh, of Justice expressed their opinion. And besides that, and uh, first and foremost, and uh, it's imperative uh, that the decisions are the decisions of the Constitutional Court of Moldova. And I would like to inform especially the international members of the Commission that on on uh, February 5th, the Constitutional Court issued a decision on the preventing. And in this case, the Constitutional Court stated that even though the special panel of the Supreme Court cannot oblige the Evaluation Commission to promote the evaluated, to, to pass the fail, the evaluated the candidate, the arguments uh, will still be mandatory for the Commission. And in this situation, we will analyze the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice, which is mandatory. And with all due respect to judges, former judges that are part of a preventing commission, I believe that it is clear for everyone that the supremacy of constitutional court and this decision is uh, binding. In this situation, regarding the payment of a tax, a tax that had the total value of, uh, it was a minimum value. Just a second, if I may. To find, well, to see the finding made by the Supreme Court of Justice on this topic. That's why I was anticipating the questions whether the content of the decision is known to the Commission members. With respect to failure to pay taxes for 2021, it is found that taking into account the circumstances mentioned above, the special panel decides that this violation is insignificant and that cannot lead to the failure of in the evaluation. So, this conclusion is mandatory for the preventing commission. Any new additional questions? about this topic the commission did not have for the candidate during the evaluation. Moreover, in the personal file that you provided to me, there is a conclusion issued by the state tax service. If I may, I will try to find that answer. In that answer from uh, the state tax service, and I uh, want to say that 
this answer was available during the evaluation, not re-evaluation. So, but it said that during that time, my husband did not file and did not have the obligation to file with a tax service according to the legislation, of course, his income tax return. The recalculation of a penalty happened uh, because it was filed for the year when the sale and purchase took place. So despite the fact that the commission is a new established body, the activity of the commission is somehow new for everyone. There are new mechanisms, but observing legal provisions is in Moldova is mandatory. And it's even more important According to the Constitution of Moldova, it is to observe a decision of a Supreme Court of Justice. And even more important is the fact that the decision of a constitutional court that obliged the Commission to accept the conclusions is also mandatory. I uh, would like to mention that the Venice Commission also expressed its opinion on the in this regard, which is mandatory for Moldova, and they said that the decisions of the Supreme Court of Justice are mandatory, are binding. I did not receive any additional questions with respect to this issue. Moreover, I will, if we uh, follow the practice that the Commission uh, expressed regarding the evaluation, the evaluation practice and especially the members that are working or have worked as judges, the practice that the previating commission started, and there is a number of decisions to pass candidates where uh, with tax violations not in case of me, myself as a candidate, but some fiscal violations were considered insignificant. And if you look at the severity of a violation that the Commission takes as a reasonable doubt, payment of 10, 20 euros tax in relation or in comparison with decision number 38, where having the obligation, the person, the, the person having the obligation to file a declaration, the person did not, but you decided that was not a violation. Violating the regime of uh, declaration of assets and uh, property, it did not reach the level of failure. Again, in some cases, income from free sources was not declared. There is one more decision to pass a candidate. We have one even more situation, more complicated one, where income worth 12,000 euros was not declared, seven land plots was, were not declared, and you deemed that uh, as not severe enough for failure. But in this case, for 20, 30 euros, you believe it's a severe violation of both ethics and financial integrity. I want to be correct, and I have been, and I uh, demand respect for the irrevocable decision, the conclusions, the decision of a constitutional court in this case, and the practice of uniform form uh, or uniformly ap applying practice in all cases, but not disproportionately compared, well, not disproportionately with respect to one candidate, that's all. Thank you, Madam Gladkov. When it comes to the first issue, we have just one clarification question, because during the initial evaluation hearing, you said you did not pay that tax because the sale purchase contract that was concluded at the notary's office that you submitted. According to that contract, the tax was supposed to be paid by the buyer. And since there have been several questions, including regarding the date of 
when the contract was registered and when it was entered in the information system, you stated during the hearing that you were going to um, investigate the issues and would uh, provide the information subsequently. After the hearing, you submitted us a confirmation that your husband paid the tax and you confirmed that today, but you did not explain an aspect that would be important for the Commission, namely, in the end, it, was it your obligation or buyer's obligation, the buyer of Atlantis, to pay this tax? Can you clarify that? I can clarify everything and I clarify that so far. We go back to the situation where we discuss effect that was discussed, found and judged upon. With all due respect, but in virtue of my position and being a citizen of Moldova, I cannot discuss right now the decisions at that time. I am going back to the manner of communication. We not talk about memory. If I remember, if I remember. So, did you check all the documents? I mean, do we try to rely on my memory or do you do we rely on documents? No, we do not rely on memory. My question was, can you clarify now? Because during the evaluation, this wasn't clarified. clarified and this would help us to finalize this issue. And be sure we take everything into account. But in the end, the re-evaluation was ruled to happen. That's why it was your case was sent to the commission by the supreme court if you want to answer that question is okay if not we can move to the next ones madam kriptievsky with documents that you submitted i tried to put them all right to understand what the uh, topic was i cannot remember in my memory did we communicate or not what was the situation you got you gave me the document i solved the problem so since communication and my memory being an evidence and all the people around me in relation to the documents that were submitted and in relation to documents from the tax service and all documents that were uh, examined in a court of law and as provided by the law, all of that has priority. And now to make some reference to memory, did it happen or did it not? When you ask me that question and having the legal possibility and potential to check and submit documents that I have no access to, we uh, just limited ourselves to some conclusions based on my recollections, my memory. That is not right. And now I want us to rely on documents because you are asking. And the other two issues relate to the participation of another person. I can tell you from my recollection, from my memory, I can tell you from what I can get somewhere, but I cannot uh, express myself based on my memories um, with respect to this evaluation. It has to be based on document to set a task um, we solve it. According to the documents, it was your obligation and not the buyers. We wanted to clarify this. You have a document that the Commission also had. My obligation in Republic of Moldova raised when the declaration was filed. This was found according to the law. Thank you, Madam Gladkov. Any other members? Do you have any questions or do we move to the second issue? The second issue relates to failure to disclose assets and personal interests in the manner prescribed by law. And number one under here is not declaration of a candidate of your husband's shares in the company. The serious doubts about this topic um, are that you failed to declare your husband's shares in a company in your annual declarations for 2017-2021 as prescribed by the law. You claim during the initial evaluation that your husband did not actively take part in company's management or its financial activities, whereas official records show, well, the ones obtained during the resumed evaluation, 
prove that your husband, who was one of the founders of the company, took part in the registration of the company and owned half of that company. Similarly to the first issue, would you like to have up to 15 minutes to provide an additional explanation? And after that, we will have some clarification questions. Thank you very much. Again, this is a topic that was addressed and already decided upon by the Supreme Court of Justice. And still we go back to the same topic. Again, I would like to draw attention to the fact that this is a decided fact on which no other legal body can express an opinion or uh, reverse the decision. And this is a mandatory thing for the privating commission. In this case, mutatis mutandis, the decision of a constitutional court is applied, whereby the decision of a Supreme Court is mandatory and the practice and the uh, recent opinion issued by the Venice Commission. In this case, I would like to communicate to the Commission that the Supreme Court of Justice highlighted that a special panel highlights that the question asked during a public hearing should not be a trap for the candidate and cannot go beyond the questions asked during the written round of questions. And the Privating Commission should have made the necessary effort to obtain the information from the candidate during the written communication. Moreover, the special uh, panel holds that calls as justified the argument that the candidate should not presume what she does not know for sure and she should not rely on a contract that was uh, provided by the husband. Sorry, I am going to check if that is... Yes, that's about non-disclosure. I did not have to presume that. Moreover, I uh, told the Commission that at the time when I found out about this circumstance, I declared the shares. Now, I would like to ask the Commission, and I had the possibility to look into uh, one of uh, uh, Raducanu's and uh, Madame Tosoria's uh, decisions on ECHR case against Moldova. You were two judges. In this case, individualizing the blame of one person is necessary or not? The documents submitted to me in the in the case, the copies, because the file itself was not provided to me. In these copies, tell me, please, did I have any income or expenses related to that company? Any income or expenses? I would like to reiterate decisions that the Evaluation Commission issued on other candidates that did not declare like seven land plots, bank accounts with the amounts of money of their spouses. In this case, you did not see an ethical violation. In case of decisions where the candidates who were passed, they uh, admitted that they entered erroneous data. You decided that not to be a violation. So tell me, please, in this situation, especially since the law on uh, NIA uh, provides for a declaration as soon as it becomes known to me. Furthermore, in court, in the, in the Supreme Court and in front of the Commission, I mentioned that ni the legislation of Moldova does not allow me to check on my husband so that I could know his activity. Law 26, stroke 2022, speaks about individualizing actions and uh, causal connection, cause-effect connection between your doubts and my actions. We also have a private life aspect and the family code under which I cannot force the person to tell me. Moreover, looking from the perspective of damages caused to state, what was the damage caused by me? Moreover, in the database, this information is available. It wasn't hidden. The declaration is declaring things that I know, of declaring what I know. I got to know that I found out about that, and I'm grateful to the Commission for taking part 
uh, in certain identification and some clarity in ownership was uh, made and I declared the shares. That's what we discussed and that's what I asked the Commission. Identify in which case I was a participant and in my speech I will reiterate that you gave a possibility uh, to a defense counsel to be presented uh, to represent you in the court and I want to make sure that the Commission's position to make sure what the Commission's position was in court. Indeed, in this case, the legislation of Moldova does not allow me to access my husband's database to identify shares from 2017 where he did not pay until, did not pay even a first rate, a first tranche. That's it. Thank you very much, Madam Gladkov. The Commission draws its conclusion, indeed based on information received and to a large extent based on the answers. And if answers were to be clearer, the Commission wouldn't have had so many questions. But please let me finalize, my dear, you during the entire initial evaluation insisted that you did not know about the shares because your husband did not take part in there. That I wanted to explain that besides the communication directly with the person who was part of that relationship, I cannot have any other factual sources. Correct, but you explained during the initial evaluation, and we had that discussion during the initial evaluation hearing, that you did not know because your husband actually did not participate there, that that company was founded without his knowledge. That's what you said. And during the resumed evaluation procedure, we obtained information and you already received that, and all the requests that were signed by your husband. That's why my question, not to go into all the details, you have them. There are four documents, all of them signed by your husband. Do you still stick to the same explanation, or do you have a different explanation about that non-disclosure of that um, share in that company. After that, we'll talk separately about its importance or lack of importance, but clarify this. Madam Khriptievsky, I, what I communicated, as in the first case, I said that based on what I can communicate about with the person involved in those relationships. When the question was asked, I asked the question in turn, and that was the answer I got. I reiterate, we are relying now on memories of a person. What? That's what I could obtain from the person in question. That was when I provided you the answer. At the same time, in order to be correct, the, I declared those shares because you confirmed to me that the, your husband has these shares, and it, I declared it. That's everything I could do in good faith in that situation, because I cannot, I will repeat that, I cannot manage memory, good faith for declarations of a person. It's only memory. So you confirm that in 2023, when you filed the declaration for 2022, you declared the shares only after the question the Commission asked you on that topic. Is that right? Probably. I will rephrase. You did not declare the shares in 2017, 2021. He's the founder. I got a confirmation that he was the founder. And then the clarification about who 
paid up for the shares who signed, who did not. Uh, that was something that was supposed to be discussed, but since he's mentioned in the database as a founder, in order to avoid interpretation, uh, so based on uh, what I found out at your hearings, I anyway had uh, the obligation, and I believed it was necessary to declare. And um, in the communication with representatives when this declaration is filled out in case we did not have any income or expenses or payments that is sort of a fictitious declaration and i mentioned uh, that before you previously mentioned that the national integrity authority answered you on that topic but could you please get some clarity did you get a written answer no, a lot of phone calls from me, because when questions came, if you remember, there was also a question about declaring the donation contract that I didn't do. I did not understand what I violated and what I was supposed to do. So in order to neutralize that, I don't want to go into family relations and obligations and communication matters. That was all I could obtain from that person. Last question that partially will answer to your question about the so-called uh, damage. According to the information available to the Commission, indeed, the company that we make reference to did not have income uh, revenues in 2017-18 only started to have income in 2019 uh, no dividends were paid by but it does not mean that they will never be paid both companies this one and the company held by your husband they are uh, both in the field of construction and one of the purpose of declaring shares is to prevent conflicts of interest. And from this perspective, the commission paid attention to it and has a question. Do you believe that it's not an ethical issue, not declaring one of these companies? Should you have known about it? ethical not declaring one of these companies so the fact that my husband tell me please myself ethically what's my connection between two companies of a husband one where he was a founder from what i understand so not declaring one of these companies do you see a problem with that or not i did not know about these legal circumstances. I explained that before, during the first hearing, the situation with these companies. Ethically, I am not in a commercial activity. I don't understand the question, what does ethics have to do with my husband's business and these companies and myself? Where is the conflict? There are many companies working in the field of construction. So non-declaration is... Well, it's not an issue only failure to declare tax, but also uh, affiliation or ownership of a company. Because the purpose of annual declarations that are filed, among other things, is to prevent potential conflicts of interest. But did you find any conflict of interest in my case? I just asked you from the point of view of declaration, because you uh, started to discuss, uh, generally, you said, during the first hearing, during the evaluation, you declared that declaration is a formality only. Once it is part of database that my husband is a founder, these things were not hidden from the state. The fact that I did not know and I don't have mechanisms to check that is only related to good faith at this stage. That I did not get any benefit from this activity. I did not have any connection with road construction, being a prosecutor. This is beyond my understanding. What? How can I speak? What kind of conflict between my competence and these two companies and the husband? And 
that company was about one period. His current activity is different. You checked all the contracts that the company had. And in these materials, you can see with his entire activity, all the contracts he had. Moreover, when you ask for the turnover to, and the accountant refused me to provide it, I tried with my husband. I am very far from his work and from everything he is doing, and that's why I uh, did not uh, have a possibility uh, to know that there is a problem of any kind, because I am not aware of all the circumstances, and I answered, and I don't even have the right according to the law and prosecution. I don't have a case to the right to manage and get involved in all these activities, and I cannot understand what's my conflict by not declaring okay, but it is in the database. It can be viewed. And at the initial stage when the commission checked this, it could have identified easily whether there was any conflict of competence between me and the two companies working in the field of road construction. <coughs> Thank you. Can uh, we move on to the next and last issue, or is there anything you would like to add? No, I have nothing else to add. All right. So the last issue has to do with serious doubts of the Commission regarding your ethic and integrity regarding the purchase price of the man truck that you declared in the annual declarations as being worth 10,000 lay approximately 560 euros for a truck that was purchased in 2017. And the doubts appeared in the light of the deposit of 95,930 lay. A deposit was made by your husband to the account of the citizen, we will not say the name, but the initials, AT, the representative of the seller, that is the owner of that truck. And there was lack of any supporting documentation um, and any other information to support the fact that that amount was returned to your husband. And also, this is in the context where in 2021, that same truck was sold by your husband for the amount of 199,500 lei and without convincing information as to the repairs and other works performed on the truck that could have increased its value by about 20 times, as well as considering the inconsistent explanations provided by you on this matter during the written communication and at the hearing that it took place as part of the initial evaluation. The Commission's doubts with regards to the real price paid for the truck are also further reinforced by a sort of, of a pattern that the Commission has noted in your annual declarations. Specifically, you declare, declare the value of 10,000 lei for at least three other vehicles that were bought and one sold by you and your husband between 2017 2019. And specifically, there was a Toyota car manufactured in 20, 2007, a Ford Transit manufactured in 2001, and a BMW manufactured in 2004. Similarly, we will give you the floor for explanations if you want to provide any, and then uh, there will be a couple of succinct questions to further clarify the matter. With regards to this matter too, I will start by reading out the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice, where the, the mandatory, which contains mandatory arguments for the preventing commission in this case. I would like to mention again that the doubts that you have just referred to as a commission, those doubts all, all have already at the previous stage, they have already raised at the time. So all the contracts for the sale and purchase were known. Those are contracts entered into by the members of the family. And the conclusion, the final conclusion that you provided with regards to the sale and purchase prices in relation to a number of cars, you expressed that as a doubt. But previously, all the information was known to the commission, but this doubt was not communicated. And in this case, it is not clear. It's not clear what conclusion is drawn 
and why, or given that previously this hasn't been regarded as a violation. What is more, in the practice that was established by the Pre-Betting Commission, which is mandatory to ensure uniform, consistent, equal application for all in a number of cases and decisions to pass candidates, and certain, in those certain instances, it was accepted by the Commission that was not indicated. So the prices were not referred to as a violation. The indicated prices were not established as a violation. In certain cases, there was also the price of 10,000 lei, and the Commission didn't find that as a doubt and did not use it as a, as a doubt that would lead to failing a candidate. As regards what the Supreme Court of Justice established in this case, it is stated that the panel has maintained that the candidate acted with diligence and the circumstances dismantled the doubts as to the fact that the candidate doesn't meet the criteria of financial and ethic integrity. It is established that the income of the candidate and her spouse are enough to cover all expenses. And there are also calculations made, taking into account the aforementioned. The panel of judges believes that the Evaluation Commission did uh, passed an unfounded decision in violation of the principle of proportionality. The court mentions also that the circumstances maintained by the Evaluation Commission uh, do not fall in line with the principle of proportionality when it comes to the reasons that, that the Commission provided for not for failing the candidate. And in this case, what is more important, it says that in this regard, these special panels underscores that considering its constitutional duty to administer justice, the court has the final competence to interpret in a specific case and a vague legal notion. Therefore, everything that was submitted by the commission that has already been subject to an examination and on this case already, a decision of the Supreme Court of Justice was pronounced. I would like to reiterate a previ the previous situation. The Supreme Court of Justice has evaluated this matter in much greater detail and in this case, too, as, it, as in the case of uh, the of declaring the shares owned in the company, the subject that was directly involved with the contract was the husband, and I am the person who communicates information to you that I find out out of communication with him. And as for, for documentation, yes, I too requested that to have also a to have more clarity about the situation. Therefore, conclusions such as that by email I received a uh, secretary that the pictures are black and white, but the car or the vehicle is blue. That's a violation of cars as old as from 1997. I would like to reiterate that the findings are somewhat uh, beyond the limits. Did I ever say what the color or that did I ever say that I was against the color that was there? Did I ever see the car? Did I know that the car, what color the car was? Was the person heard or asked? Well, according to the law of Moldova, in addition to the con to the contract signed uh, by the parties, I will like uh, speaking about it. I mean, if I can declare it, if there's a signed contract or not, I can st say information about what I can believe or remember. For instance, the husband would come and say the price is two million. What should I declare? The contract or the price that was communicated to me? What it was in the contract or what was said to me if my husband came and said it was two million one day. So this subject, this issue, I believe, or to, to me, this is important, but did I harm in any way? Did I cause any, uh, any was it any, in any way detrimental to the government that I did it like that? I did. It wasn't detrimental. Was there a divergence between income and expenses in this case? No. Was it established that there was a contract, a sale and purchase contract? Because the declaration tell, uh, demands that I declare contracts or these agreements, sale and purchase agreements. Was there any other agreement with a different? Was there a different agree agreement with a different amount for the sale and purchase of the uh, of the vehicle? No. But what is more important. Am I the subject there? I am not. So uh, an eloquent example is one of the decisions of 
the Pre-Vetting Commission, in a particular case, I think there's also a number of that. Let me see if I find it. One of the decisions, and in this regard, we are speaking about my request and the obligation not to um, apply double standards to candidates. I would like to raise the issue that out of all the verification that I was subject to and looking at all the documentation that was accumulated and out of everything that I hope international members also had access to and I keep counting on the professionalism of the members, both national and international. There were cases where the candidates were directly involved. In their cases, you decided to pass candidates where there were indirect cases, such as mine, when it comes to uh, the fact that about 20, that, that a tax wasn't paid allegedly and to, uh, with re regard to, to two contracts where I was not a party. So in this case, you decided not to pass me. I will not turn to an objective observer regarding this case that I am guilty of these violations. And considering that in my inbox, I've also received an analysis of the doubts, which is the same as like a copy paste regarding the failure to pay taxes. And if I'm not mistaken, in regards to, well, the second issue, I didn't even receive additional questions, I believe. So for, for so issues, for those issues that were irrevocably, that where a final decision was taken on, we can't go back to that. And at that I would like to underscore all the society and the, the prosecutors expect for the law to be observed. I want an example of law being observed in Moldova to take place. Although I might not be show empathy perhaps to some of the participants, I hope that such an exception doesn't exist. I nevertheless ask that this be treated objectively impartially and equally and proportionately as it happened in other cases where the preventing commission applied its practice. Certainly the commission has a regulation that it follows and we established it according to the regulation, the, act, the documents aren't to be signed, although the regulation says that there should be the case that affects the mandate of the participants and members of the commission, the regulation says that, but in the case of, of the members from the Republic of Moldova, the decision of the Constitutional Court is mandatory as well as the practice. And as for the international members, with all due respect, it is mandatory to take into account, into account the Venice Commission opinion that established that it is mandatory that the decision is in, enforceable. And those doubts that initially were there, they were addressed and solved definitively, and they cannot be subject to a reevaluation. This is what I wanted to communicate. In addition to this, although these issues might not even, um, I might have not even addressed these issues, but even in this case, I would like to mention that I was not a participant. I was not a party to that contract. According to the law, I can tell the commission what I was told in my turn by a third party that was a party to the contract. But in this regard, this, uh, this requires an individualized perception or view on my actions, with a view on my actions, on my ethics, and the possibility to prevent or to somehow respond to cases like this. What I had to declare was the contract. I did not see the car. I did not participate. I don't know about re repairs because I was asked about some repairs that were done, performed on a man truck from 1997. The picture is black and white. In 2017, seriously, seven there were seven undeclared land plots and uh, bank accounts with money on them not declared. Is there the threshold of doubt 
that well a threshold of doubt that the commission uh, on its own established and in this case the 1997 man truck of my husband where where he dealt with that and i had nothing to do with it that was all from me thank you madam gladkov now i would like to ask you a couple of clarification questions but just to to say that the obligation of the person filing the annual declarations on income and personal interests to remind that what is included in the declaration is what the declarant is has responsibility for that is an obligation that is provided for by the law now according to the bank records the bank records that are available to the commission so according to them on the 29th of june 2017 your husband deposited the amount of 95,930 lei into the account of the representative of the owner of the truck and the purpose of the deposit was indicated as payment for a loan in your written answers to to the commission during the initial evaluation you explained that the purpose of this loan was payment for the man truck which was offered for sale on the internet is that right yes that's what my husband told me and the truck had a, um, a bank lien and your husband paid the amount and accompanied the representative of the owner to release that truck from the bank lien and to purchase the truck, correct? Nadezhda, this is going back to the initial evaluation. Yes, we need to clarify certain aspects. I cannot tell you out of my memory. Yes, if my memory was that, as in maybe if I was involved personally, I would have remembered perhaps. But now you are taking me back into making suppositions. But during the evaluation, if you have, you mean, but let's go without suppositions and let's focus on the facts again. You said you kept declaring that the price of this truck was 10,000 lei. I declared that on the basis of the agreement and on the basis of what I declared in the declarations. I want you to get me right. In this regard, I relied on the documents that I had, and now I will not be able to provide an interpretation. We want to clarify certain things. You have a contract for 10,000 lei that was entered into on uh, in August 2017, the 17th of August. We also have information about the banking uh, data. Um, that was made available during the initial evaluation that on the 29th of June 2017, your husband deposited or made a transfer of 95,930,000 actually, two transfers that total that to the account of that representative of the owner of the truck. During the resumed evaluation, we obtain more detailed information regarding this transfer that is indicative of the fact that the purpose of the transfer that actually it says that the purpose of the transfer was the loan were related to the loan and that the sources were like professional work one's one's work that is the, the your the the work that your husband was doing his job so to speak when the transfer was made he said that the, the sources were was were from his own work you during the initial evaluation you kept saying that these ninety five thousand this is the money given by the owner of the truck to the husband the husband transferred that to the account of the representative of the owner of the truck now the question is how was the money given back to your husband if that ever happened madam hryptievsky the documentation that you have that you obtained at the initial stage i did not have the possibility to to, to look into that i didn't have access to that but now in terms of declarations and my communication with the husband now consider also the, the documentation that you have 
Well, that is the documents that you have. I cannot give any appreciation as to what that says. Well, yes, if that is issued by a bank, if that's what it's stated, but with certainty, I can tell you that there were no loans to take a loan. No, your husband transferred on uh, to the account of the representative of an owner of the account 95,000 lei to pay up the pledge. Well, you are asking me a question, but you I did not participate in that transaction, but you explained and you continue to insist that a truck purchased on 17th of August 2017 cost 10,000 lei. At the same time, now I'm speaking of the fact that, uh, I mean, the documentation that I have to be able to declare, what I have to support my declaration is, is, is that. The commission showed you at the very beginning information about it. What is up with the 95,000? And the simple question is the following. Your husband transferred to the representative of the owner of the truck the amount of 95,938. Is this amount actually a part of the cost of that truck? All right. Now, I will go back to what I know. I do not know if that is a part or if it's something else. Out of what I know and what you know is there was a transfer. Currently, my communication with my husband is this. I don't know if that is a part of the contract. I want you to get me right. And you don't have any information whatsoever as to whether this money has ever been paid back to your husband. And if that was returned, then how was that returned? Was it by the owner of the truck? I don't know if that's a payment under a contract. If it's not a payment under a con contract, I don't know if there was any obligation to return or not to return. If there is an act that confirms or otherwise that, then if there was such an act. But I can only communicate to you what I know from a third party that was a party to that contract. Understood. Now, during the initial evaluation, you never mentioned certain repairs or costs associated with repairs of the truck. And it was only after well, after being heard in the initial evaluation, you sent another message with additional documentation. You mentioned that you've only received that later. And there you declared that the truck was repaired by um, your husband. And that was the explanation why it cost 10,000 in 2017 and then in a few years later, it already cost almost 200,000. You sent you sent that message. Well, as it was established in the Supreme Court of Justice, is that well, there were questions. In, there were questions that initially I didn't know of, and then when I was given that specific task, you can look. I mean, the video recording was looked at by my husband too. He saw it and he explained to me what the situation was. In those cases, considering well that currently I've seen in the presented materials, I've seen that you managed to obtain information about how the equipment was refurbished, the 3,000 plus expenses associated and all the rest is welcome. I think you've analyzed, you've analyzed the profile of my husband too, when it comes to cars and all of that, that activity. There's been a lot of activity in this regard that he was engaged with. As for me to say how much it cost and where that was, was it refurbished or not? I didn't know. Madam Gladkov, do you agree that an impartial observer couldn't not have any question marks? I disagree. If uh, the price is 10,000 in 2017, and five years later, it's 200,000 lei. Well, certainly, but this observer, no, the idea was that in the pu initial public hearing, questions were asked that, well, I, I was in a situation to, to try to explain something that I did not participate in and that I had no, no knowledge of. So in the other situation too, just to understand, it was only after the public hearing that 
I understood what questions I had to answer about a car that I've never seen, a vehicle that I've never seen in my life. Madam Gladkov, those questions were sent to you during the initial evaluation, but let's leave that aside. Now we're doing the re-evaluation and let's try to get to the bottom of it. The Commission has asked you questions in an attempt to clarify what those refurbishments and repairs were about. You said that you didn't have that information and that the Commission has all the competencies in the, 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 to actually look it up. And we looked it up and you, you were sent that information in the Statement of Facts according to the information available to the Commission. The only repairs and the refurbishment that was performed on the truck was worth 3,580 lei. Now the question is, a truck purchased for 10,000, can it be refurbished for that cost only 3,000 and then make it cost 200,000? 3,580 lei was spent for refurbishment of a 10,000 worth truck that was sold for 200,000 lei later. The question is, was this the only thing or was it was there more repair actually done on that, more refurbishment? Well, honestly, when I talked to my husband, if I'm not mistaken, there might have been some other refurbishment as well. It is complicated given that his work, his work, well, that is part of his work. He personally too does some repairs. He fixes it here and there. It's very complicated. You put me in a situation to, to uh, of someone who should analyze the market of uh, vehicle renovation. So uh, you're asking me about the cost of a man truck and how can I be knowledgeable about it? Madam uh, Gladkov, we asked you questions about it, but should I have gone to my husband and uh, for him to tell me that I've uh, replaced two wheels, for instance, it's not about the wheels, to increase the value more than 20 times that requires something an input to to argue that and to, to we need to know more to, to cast the doubts away but in the even in this situation there are doubts are the doubts about to me is it like i repair the truck and i hit that away it's doubts about the declaration the way it was declared but yet again i am here to i, I would like to repeat you and the commission are somehow trying to and i think this will be practice for the future vetting activities we have the obligation to declare but i have the obligation to declare what i have in front of me when i look at it like a document i can't declare something outside of a document well since we're speaking about the rule of law all contracts agreements should show the actual situation the real price not a different price i agree but there was a decision of the pre-vetting commission when the person, uh, per, there was a decision and the person him herself declared a different uh, price and that was not regarded as a violation you pass that person. So tell me about the proportionality, considering that I was found to be at fault. That's all the more so I can't at, at present confirm or otherwise anything. I have the documents that I have. And as for the communication, if I may, to keep the secret of family relations, communication is, this is what all the communication that all the, this is all that the communication was about and that I was able to provide to you. Now that you've also mentioned colors, to try to address briefly this matter, do you know what the color of the truck was? Or do you admit that by mistake, perhaps, you might have sent the pictures of a different truck? Because we checked and we understood that your husband has several trucks. I, because we need to understand, I understand there are pictures, I was asked if I have any pictures, I've asked for pictures from my husband in 2017, we've never talked about uh, the color and I've never indeed seen that truck, if I'm not mistaken, the pictures are black and white. According to the data, the car, the truck was blue, so we couldn't confirm whether it was that or that truck or a different truck. Now, another question of clarification. During the initial evaluation, you sent a rental agreement of the 1st of July 2017 related to this truck, and there was an agreement between your husband and, uh, and, and, and a company so it was signed off by your husband as director. 
can you explain how this contract for this truck have been signed on the 1st of July if it was purchased on the 17th of August? But you didn't ask that question previously. It was in the facts. Now it was worded as a question. Perhaps, but now it turns out that I have to go back and clarify these things again. Okay, we can go back to this for further clarification later. Okay, it's only worded in a way that I understand what the question is about, because I too, in my turn, have to find out what the situation is. Okay, we will clarify then separately later on with regards to this specific rental agreement of July 2017. Regarding this uh, issue, I don't have other questions, but just a second to ask if other members would like to take the floor and ask questions. Yeah, I have um, just uh, one question from my side, and it uh, picks up on uh, the last part of the discussion we just had. Um, in the statement of facts, uh, we ask you to explain um, the pictures uh, that were sent to the commission, um, and you indicated that, or we we saw that, or you indicated that uh, your husband managed to locate them in the memory of his phone. Um, but at the same time, you also say that you don't know where the pictures were taken, when they were taken, and where, etc. But isn't it the case that if pictures are included, phone, I don't have access to my husband's phone. But that 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 may be right. My wife doesn't have access to my phone. But if I need pictures and I need dates, then my wife is able to tell me because in the pictures and as part of those pictures, there's always an indication where it is taken and where time it is taken. I don't think it was, uh, I think it would have been useful for us, but maybe you still want to do that, to provide further documentation and, and support on where those pictures were taken because they may actually be relevant for our um, resumed evaluation. That would be my question. Mr. Herman, it may have been maybe useful, but I don't understand what for. Uh, well, but I believe that this uh, truck exists. It is possible to find it and to take a photo, take photos of it, and to see how that how it looks like. I think that would be more simple. I mean, yeah, if uh, it were my phone, my phone's data. Yes, but I don't understand uh, the importance of the pictures. Once, well, if we'll search on Google to check how that car looks initially out of the factory and how it looks today, because it can be found, I think this is what can be done so that we could talk about some objective things because again we talk about photos of photos from my husband's phone or somewhere else i don't know how objective that is in this case in order not to raise any other doubts i am i welcome this exercise but i i am not envisaged by that contract and i actually i would be interested in that too i mean before the pre-vetting, uh, I did not even know uh, what my husband does most of, what are his skills or what he is doing. I mean, I didn't realize uh, what technically re-equipment or repeating means, but I have no idea what exactly they did, what colors, what spare parts. That's complicated. You are... Uh, I want everyone to understand this. It is not clear... I mean, do we, we we are trying to identify some doubts regarding ethical financial integrity of me, but ethics and financials here somehow relate to the color of a vehicle. I may be wrong, but if I were the owner and not being a Daltonic, I could say that it's blue or black and white or someone something else, or that the picture is black and white. I really don't understand how objective this is, the, how objective this question is. 
I have no further questions. Um, da. Yeah. Uh, uh, stimată doamna Gladkov, uh, in orice evaluare... Madam Gladkov, in any evaluation, a very important aspect is the credibility of what is communicated and what is submitted by the person subject to evaluation. Because every evaluation includes certain subjective aspect. And when several people can't understand what a person wants to say, that raises a big question. And when we talk about the color, that is not the entire evaluation. The main doubt the Commission had about this topic is about a very simple fact. In your declarations for several years, you declared that truck as being purchased in 2017 for 9,999 lei. When we ask you, did it really cost that much, given that your husband transferred to a person representing the owner 95,000 lei, you provided several explanations that we were not exactly able to comprehend and what was the connection. And you sent pictures of a truck and you said it was renovated. When we tried to obtain the official information about that truck, we saw that actually it's a different truck, it's a blue one. And in written questions, we tried to clarify because maybe we wouldn't even gotten here if we managed to clarify that in writing. But I think today we had a quite broad opportunity to clarify this topic in details. Thank you for your answers. And if you want to add something now about the last topic, please do. If not, I would like to give the floor to the chair. Victoria wants to say something, ask a yeah. question. Okay. Victoria has a question. Victoria, go ahead first. Yeah, yeah that's just very briefly. I would just like to say that um, I don't consider pictures of what the vehicle looks like today particularly relevant as to what we were asking about, which was the value of the car, both at the time it was purchased and then again at the time it was sold. So pictures that were given to us with the representation that those were pictures at the time that your husband owned the vehicle would be far more relevant than pictures of the car today owned by someone else with who knows what events took place. So I'm just saying that so that you have uh, at least my understanding of why I would find that, that relevant. Uh, yes, Madam Victoria, but it is possible to see. You, you found it that it was recouped. I am transforming now in a mechanic. You found that it was re-equipped and it is possible to search it on Google, how it looked uh, in 1997 when issued from the factory. I think that would be more uh, useful for the evaluation. Now, I did that, for instance, and I saw how it looked like for me as a woman to understand what that re-equipment meant, because there are documents confirming that the vehicle was re-equipped. I don't have the possibility, but you can have the possibility to see how it looks like today. Any, well, where I wasn't and where I didn't see anything, I cannot provide any explanations. And I understand, obviously, that what Madam Nadezhda was saying and that all participants, and we had that we were through this stage at the beginning and later on, and I, uh, provided arguments uh, that as a person who did not take part in this, I don't know details and I have no knowledge of this field. I tried to. I was told, uh, can I find some picture somewhere? I mean, again, I have to find it from a third person, maybe somehow. Again, we're talking about some presumptions, but these presumptions turn into doubts subsequently, somehow. And even though uh, Madame Nadezhda in some cases suggests me to uh, presume uh, what a third party did in, in a case or another, this is what I wanted to make you understand. Probably we'll have more communication after this public uh, hearing. 
I, I, I think the, the core of the issue is and that follows up on what uh, Victoria is just saying. Your husband bought a car at a particular date for the price of 10000 and he was later on, he was able to sell it for a much higher price. Um, and some repairs may have taken place in between the moment that he bought it and in between the moment and then later on when he sold it. So any... And, and the, the, the fact that the price course, is really 20 times higher creates some questions. So pictures that would demonstrate the status of the car at the moment when your husband bought it and the moment what has happened in the meantime up to the moment that it was sold may assist us in mitigating the doubts that there may be in relation to this issue. I think that is the core of our concern, of course, and that is where um, any information that you could provide in terms of uh, pictures and the dates and where they were taken, etc., may be of, of relevance. I think that is the message that we are, are trying to, to bring across. Um, <laughs> Da, domnul Hebel, eu l-am înțeles și inițial, dar bă, este un dubiu, bă, hai să spunem așa, tangențial în ceea ce ține de activitatea sau de acțiunile soțului. Asta vorbesc. We have no translation. O clipă, doamna Gladkov, vă rugăm, sunt ceva da, probleme cu traducerea. Ați înțeles, da, ok. Uh, is, is translation back? Just a second, trying to fix it. Okay. Sorry, I am back now. I had some internet issues. And... Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, back back to you, Mrs. Klepkov. You were responding to my uh, comment, and I think that by this we would come to the end of the hearing. But would you like to repeat what you were just saying in, in terms of the, the pictures uh, and the issues about the dates, etc.? Please go ahead. Um, I want to say that what the practice of the pre-vetting commission showed me, and I really uh, welcome it. It coincides with ECHR practice, uh, case law and with national practice that all this evaluation and law 26 of 2022 on pre-vetting mean individualizing the accountability of a person and in this case even though it was found that income and expenses allowed the purchase and and that was found by the decision of a supreme court of justice individualizing my actions or my intent in order to be able to draw a conclusion about the uh, guilt of a person in this case, uh, uh, th that's what I wanted to mention. It's about individualizing from the purpose set by that law to perform the evaluation and the check of uh, ethical and financial integrity, even though all family members are checked, but individualizing me as a subject, and I want to highlight the practice um, used by the Privetting Commission in the passing decisions uh, because there were such cases and in other cases it was not found as a violation. That is what I want to point out, to reiterate in this case. Okay. I think with this, we we come to the end of the uh, of our hearing this afternoon for the resumed evaluation. Is there anything else you would like to say at this moment, or uh, can we wrap up? Please go ahead if you would like to. Da, Hebel, dacă permit, un pre... deci, if I may, 
Mr. Hebel, you are the chairperson of this commission, and in this situation, given that during the uh, court you were represented by a uh, defense counsel and he was the spokesperson in that case for you and the commission, and I would like to highlight that even, even in the additional questions asked, there were no other doubts than the ones that the Supreme Court has already expressed on. And I would like to read some statements because I obtained the minutes of a court hearing at the Supreme Court of Justice. At that hearing, the representative of a commission mentioned that that I, as a candidate, is generally a person with integrity. We presume she is. And if we uh, make obstruction of the the existence of two doubts, it is confirmed that there are no other violations, at least no others detected by the Commission in this case. This finding is important because, because that is also the opinion of a pre-vetting Commission that was expressed by the representative of the Commission during the court hearings. And I would like to highlight here that taking into account the practice of the revetting commission, taking into account the uh, binding nature of uh, final and irrevocable decisions and all the findings on all matters, taking into account that other issues were not found or addressed, taking into account that even though in court only copies were submitted and as a result of a, a request to oblige some more uh, folders were submitted to, if I'm not mistaken, that confirm the confirm my financial and ethical integrity. I would like to mention that I hope that by the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice, the right to the language of a trial was violated, so English, and I would like to be firm that all members, national and international, really had access and read my entire file. It was... Well, this conclusion of the commission was important for me because I was, as a prosecutor, analyzed 12 years of activity and I think Ms. Raducanu can agree with me that is important for a professional. On the three issues that were discussed, They were discussed and things were pointed out and it's important to mention in this case that even though the decision of a Supreme Court of Justice had a dissenting opinion expressed by one seconded judge to be part of the panel, I would like to mention and to raise awareness of the, especially of the international members of the Privating Commission. The dissenting opinion was issued on August 1st, 2023, where the judge found and realized this dissenting opinion on the provision of a law, namely, I conclude that based on the applicant's uh, arguments uh, we cannot find the uh, existence of we cannot find existence of arguments that would uh, justify resumption of the uh, procedure i would like to now reiterate that the constitutional court by his decision uh, number five in 2023 which is mandatory for everyone it's mandatory to be applied and it has priority and point two mentions there that that text if it finds the existence of circumstances that could have led to the, prom to the uh, passing of a candidate is declared unconstitutional. Therefore, this dissenting opinion is relied on a provision that was declared unconstitutional back in February. So in February it was declared unconstitutional and the dissenting opinion was filed in August. An unconstitutional provision cannot be applied and uh, if I may, that was about the procedure of 
re-evaluation. I still am on the same position and I hope I will get the documents and I'll explain why. The candidates file on re failure, I hope not, but or uh, passing in Moldova should include an administrative document issued by a public authority. According to the practice of the Supreme Court of Justice, as well as practice or um, decisions uh, that were issued by the Constitutional Court, the pre-vetting commission was uh, recognized as a public authority that issues uh, administrative acts. Um, and in this case, we have Article 121 of Administrative Code that uh, provides that signing by signing physically or electronically Chronically. Sorry, I asked her to speak slower. She's just reading out in her fastest speed. In this case, for us as candidates and myself included, for for me to have a valid document in order to move forward with an appeal or passing this exercise, it is necessary for me to have a document that in Moldova needs to be an individual act signed either electronically or physically. Uh, this individual administrative act is void if not signed. That's uh, according to the administrative code. I think that is my request, but I think it's valid for all the candidates as well, because we are all in Moldova and it shouldn't be uh, invoked that we don't have an administrative act as a result of uh, this. This will net not uh, take long. At the first evaluation that took place at the public hearing uh, of uh, myself as a candidate was much more complex and it was followed uh, by uh, an annulment by the Supreme Court of Justice and I don't know if the international members know but there has been a General Assembly of Prosecutors and by the vote of around 395 prosecutors at the General Assembly it was decided uh, by the uh, suffer prosecutors to obey the law and the fact that we were not assessed and unless we are uh, evaluated the General Assembly cannot take place and uh, on that occasion I would like to say that I have um, I want to express all my respect towards the uh, prosecution court and according to the practice that took place and my personal practice which is an example for everyone I am confident that prosecutors will move on uh, into vetting, but in this case, in order to have reputation, a good reputation, above reproach as required by the pre-vetting law, it is necessary to respect the uh, Venice Commission opinions, uh, Constitutional Court and its decisions, and the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice. I reiterate, regardless of a personal position of each member of a commission, there has to be an objective decision, proportionate decision in this case. And this is uh, related to the example of a commission, commission being an example for the society, for each prosecutor, an example of uh, respecting the law in the country, respected both by national and international members. This is a very important message. I can inform the Commission that we didn't exercise with the entire uh, staffing of prosecutors. We analyzed all decisions and all prosecutors of uh, Moldova were quite young. Mainly we grew uh, with decisions uh, from ECHR uh, on, based on the case law that they have and we count a lot on the fact that here and after, uh, you will uh, prove respect towards principles, um, 
imposed by the Venice Commission, its opinion, and the CHR. I thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your closing comments. And with that, of course, we come to the end of the hearing. I thank you for being with us this afternoon uh, and answering all the questions that we had. Um, as you know, the procedure is now that the Commission will withdraw for the liberations. And as much as possible, the decision will, the Commission will strive at delivering a recent and also signed by me decision, um, which reflects the final position based, of course, on all the materials that we have studied. Um, including all the translations that were necessary in order for the international members to participate in this process. Um, with that being said, I hereby declare the hearing closed and thanks again for being with us this afternoon. Bye-bye.